prices here in Houston, Texas, and the clear like Thunderbolt Regatta is about to happen, the first heat of the international division. I'm Steve Evans with Brock Yates and Ed Bruce, who is down in Clearwater, Florida. Well, trouble right at the beginning, Steve. U-21, the Yellow Pages boat with Mitch Evans on board, climbing out of the cockpit there. He's got engine problems. He won't make the start. And the start is unique itself. When the one-minute gun sounded, the clock you see in the lower right-hand corner of your screen started to move, and they have to try to time that to be right at the starting line when that time evaporates now. And Todd Yarling and Jimbo McConnell have timed it perfectly, Brock. You're absolutely right, Steve. And two very interesting boats. Big contrast, the tunnel hull, four-engine outboard of Jimbo McConnell versus the old conventional of Todd Yarling, a boat that we understand was started to be constructed over 22 years ago. And it took the guy 15 years to build a boat. It's only been in competition for about seven years. Todd Yarling went way wide in turn one. We're now coming out of turn two. And you can bet that Yarling is on that nitrous oxide button. And there's no rooster tail whatsoever from the outboard-powered boat, Brock. And very little noise, Steve. It's very quiet. All that noise you hear is that monster Allison, that supercharged engine in the Arling boat, but the USA-1 with the four outboards just whispering along. Doesn't even look like it's going all that quickly. Of course, it is running probably nearly 150 miles an hour. Hard to believe that that boat last season had two supercharged automotive engines amidship. Right, Steve, and of course, with the four outboards, the boat is very light and handles beautifully. Notice how McConnell is tucked right in against the buoys as he comes off turn four. And look at Todd Yarling way out there in the bull rushes with that big, heavy old boat. Todd Yarling, I think, just getting the feel for the course. Uh, that boat may be a dinosaur to some people, but it's had three top three finishes in the past year, so it is competitive. And very reliable. It's a big, strong boat, and it's got a very reliable, supercharged Allison engine. As we see, Jimbo McConnell in that four-engine tunnel hull experimental outboard coming down into turn one, Steve. Well, not only is this Jimbo McConnell's first unlimited race, it's the first unlimited race for outboard-equipped boats. A special dispensation from the American Power Boat Association to try this kind of competition, and it could be the wave of the future, Brock. They're starting to realize that uh, those old World War II vintage uh, airplane engines cannot be around all that much longer. Well, let's not forget, Steve, that the old Rolls Royces and Allisons from World War II are about to celebrate their 40th birthdays, and uh, they're getting a little bit long in the tooth. <laughs> well, the old girl bolted in front of Todd Yarling, uh, not showing her age too much today, but Jimbo McConnell is showing all the doubters on the beach that the outboards can indeed be maybe more than competitive, but that figures. They are V8 outboards. There's four of them times 500 horsepower each. That'll match the power of the Allison any day. Tremendous talent on the team that's behind this Miss USA boat. Don Arano, who we talked about, the famed designer of the cigarette hulls and uh, numerous other offshore racing boats, and Gary Garbick, the master builder. Brock Yates had a chance to talk to Jimbo McConnell, the master driver of the Miss USA outboard hydroplane. Hey, Jimbo, I know it's been a, a big thrash uh, with, uh, I guess, maybe you multiplied the problems by a factor of four, but it seems like things are getting better now. Huh? Yeah, I think we've all got it dialed in. Uh, when we left Florida to come down here, we had it dialed in. In and it seems like it's the old Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it'll happen at the race. And uh, our first run, we dialed it in, and it was right at home, and the water was very rough, and the wind was blowing, and it, it averaged 102, which qualified us. So then we thought, well, we've got this now. We'll get serious, and from there on, it, everything went downhill. And at 10.30 last night, we finally got everything dialed in, and uh, it qualified this morning at 111 on the uh, driver's qualification. And uh, we feel confident that... Hopefully, we've got everything dialed in correctly. Well, Jumbo McConnell would be pleased to know that he's already had a fast lap in this heat at over 103 miles an hour, so he has really shown him the way home right now. Even though we've said this is Jimbo McConnell's first unlimited hydroplane race, this boat is very similar to the Formula One boats and other uh, types of boats that Jumbo has raced for almost 20 years. Todd Yarling is a 26-year-old unlimited rookie on the circuit this year, but has plenty of experience, Brock, in the 280 cubic inch hydroplanes in the Midwest. Fine young talent. He sure is, and he's doing a fine job running this big, strong boat. But unfortunately, it's all Jimbo McConnell at this particular point, at least unfortunately from Todd Yarling's point of view, because as he comes off turn four, you can see how beautifully that four-engine outboard is running right now. Just just smooth as glass, and of course, these boats handle pretty well in rough water. 
So if he gets into a real hard race, he should be able to run in the wakes of the bigger hydroplanes pretty easily, Steve. And look at the perfect attitude of that hull, Brock. About the only thing in the water is the foot and the propellers on those four giant outboards. Well, Jimbo's got it trimmed out beautifully. Of course, he's got a hydraulic trim that he can... Uh-oh. Dead in the water is Jerry Hopp, the U-29 boat. Some very expensive smoke coming out of that engine. Sure is, Steve. That's one of those vintage Rolls-Royce Merlins we talked about earlier, and let's hope it isn't damaged too badly because they're getting rare. It may be that Jerry Hopp's thinking about repowering the outboards because the way Jimbo's going, they are the wave of the future. Earlier, Steve Evans had a chance to look at these outboard power plants. Here at Clear Lake, for the very first time, we're seeing some new technology, outboard motors. In fact, a quartet of 450 horsepower outboards on the Miss USA boat co-owned by Gary Garbrick, one of the leading boat designers in this country. Gary, uh, what is it going to take to seriously challenge those antique uh, World War II motors? Well, we don't know. That's one of the reasons we're here, is to find out just where we're at as far as being competitive with these uh, mass horsepower traditional unlimited hydroplane boats. And uh, we're pretty encouraged because this particular Johnson or Evinrude V8 motor has run on the European circuit for the last couple of years. And we ran them for the first time in North America this last year and had a very good series. So we thought, well, since the Unlimited Commission was good enough to let us use it as a trial method, we thought we'd stack four on this boat, which, which had inboards in it last year, and kind of see where we're at. Well, they are truly awesome outboards. Not exactly what you'd want to take bass fishing, because they are v 8 and produce almost 500 horsepower apiece, as Steve Evans said earlier. Well, Brock, I hope that Jerry Hopp has a fishing license because we get word from his pits that, uh, indeed, a fish got hung up in the water inlet and cooked that motor. It overheated. Jimbo McConnell wins the first heat of the day. And the first time out for that boat. Gary Garbrecht and the whole crew have got to be delighted as Todd Yarling smokes that old boat across the finish line in second place. Good job by Todd. He really manhandled that thing around this two-mile course here at Clear Lake, Steve. And for a rookie, looked like a real pro. And if the crew, Brock, can make some adjustments to that boat so that Todd can run tighter on the boys, oh, U-22 may be even more competitive than we next see. And as Jimbo McConnell heads toward the dock to celebrate his first ever unlimited victory, stay with us. We'll be back. This is the start of the championship heat number one. These are the quicker qualifiers in this field. And we've got a whole bunch of different kinds of boats running, Steve. Yes, we do. We've got the Allisons. We've got the Rolls-Royce Merlins. We've got outboards. We've got supercharged automotive engines. It should be a very interesting race. As the one-minute clock reaches 45 seconds, the field heads down for the starting line. And, of course, as you said earlier, the timing is critical here. You cross the line too early before that little clock closes up there, and it's a one-lap penalty. So it's kind of about to be heaved out of the race, Steve. Terrific start by Ron Armstrong of the U-80 boat, and he immediately goes to the lead. That's Armstrong on the outside as they go into turn number one. You know, there's a big set of fins up there. That's uh, like a wing on a race car. It keeps the tail down and is a stabilizing factor, although you'll see some of the other boats in this race, race are not using those big fins, but they seem to be uh, on most of the really fast boats. Well, Brock, here we get a look at the leader, Ron Armstrong, in U-80. You mentioned the wings, the Australian boat, Bill Baberton, who is in this heat. They took a look at the wings when they got here and said, aha, Australians love wings. Witness the America's Cup. So they built one, put it on it, but it just didn't work right. Here's Renato Molinari, who is uh, in the fifth spot with the twin outboards from Italy. Renato is uh, quite a few boat lengths behind this man, Ron Armstrong. Earlier, just before the start of this heat, Brock Yates had a chance to talk to Ron Armstrong before he climbed into his unlimited hydroplane. How's the boat running? Oh, really good. We couldn't be pleased with any more than what it is. It's, everything looks good. We've had some problems, but we think we got everything handled now. Water good for you today? Yeah, should be. Uh, we haven't been out yet. Uh, I haven't really got any times with the clock, so I'm just going to have to wing it and play it by ear. So it's kind of a good tune-up heat for us. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. Currently running second in this championship heat is the U-40 boat, Miss Houston, driven by John Prevost of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But he's uh, quite a few boat lengths behind Ron Armstrong. Armstrong uh, was the fastest qualifier in this particular heat at uh, a little over 113 miles an hour. Well, there is one of the boats without the wings, Steve, that we talked about earlier. He and Baberton have decided not to run with the wings, although, as we understand it, you can put them on if you really need them. 
And it looks like Ron Armstrong uh, is running just fine with his wing set. And it looks like, Rod, that the wing actually does work, and we can see it as that boat is settled down in the water, tight to the water. It's not bouncing around, moving around. He sure is. He's running really well. That's Ron Armstrong uh, coming down the back straight. As we see, John Prevost there in the right side of your screen, he's come to a halt. Engine problems or whatever has put him out, and that puts George Johnson into second place in the U8 Executon boat, Steve. And that is the cleanest, prettiest boat, I think, on the water, Brock. It sure is pretty, Steve, and that puts Merlin-powered, Rolls-Royce-powered engine boats in one and two. But look at this stock block boat of Terry Turner whistled by Armstrong. A little hot rod power from the Southern California, the Ferris supercharged Chevrolet passenger car engines. Really, in fact, it's handling very well on the inside, Brock. Well, Turner is doing a fine job. That's in one of the older conventional boats. And look at Armstrong. He got way. He's about ready to go into that Marino over there. But uh, he gets it back under control. He did go way wide. Turner tucked in tight against the buoy and has himself a little bit of a lead. And boy, he came out of nowhere with that uh, twin-engine Chevrolet-powered boat. Just a terrific battle for second spot between George Johnson on the outside, the aircraft engine, and automotive power for Terry Turner on the inside. And you get a really good look at the contrast in the hull designs here, Steve. On the inside, Terry Turner in the older front engine conventional hull, and Johnson on the outside in that cab over rear engine. Interesting, too, Steve, that probably Terry Turner's got himself somewhat a smaller displacement than uh, Armstrong. The, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines have a displacement of about 2,250 cubic inches, whereas Terry Turner's two stock blocks may be, what, 1,000 cubic inches total, 500 apiece? That's exactly right. And a lot of teams have tried automotive power, Brock. In your opinion, why has it not been more successful? Well, I would think it's just a question of not enough time and effort being put forth in it. These big uh, aircraft engines have been pretty readily available, so I don't think anybody spent any time developing these things but boy the way Terry Turner is just smoking around this course with those two Chevrolets you've got to think there's a big future for them a big future if for no other reason than the aircraft engines may someday just literally disappear as you said earlier they're over 40 years of age the tractor pullers are now using them uh, to a great extent they're blowing them up the airplane racers are blowing them up and everybody is hunting all over the country all over the world trying to find a secret cache of those engines and there just probably isn't any left. But here's old Terry Turner with a thousand less cubic inches hanging right there with George Johnson and that executive on both. So it, it bodes well for people who might be thinking about building some stock block and limited hydroplanes. But I'll tell you something else, Brock. Terry is having to twist those Chevrolet engines uh, almost double the RPM of that aircraft power plant. You're absolutely right. And uh, the general... Uh, uh, punishment he's taking in that front engine boat is a lot more than George Johnson. Although, of course, a stock block setup could be put in one of the more modern rear engine boats. That uh, boat of Terry's is a pretty old haul. Well, boat racing fans all over the country, Brock, are watching today's action very, very carefully. The APBA understanding that uh, they've got to take a look at some of these other combinations, and this is really the first time that they've all been together at one event. And it sure is fun to watch them all racing around here at Clear Lake. All the V8s, the outboards, and in particular, this leader right here, Ron Armstrong, and that big Rolls-Royce Merlin-powered boat of his, he just hasn't had any problems at all, and he's unchallenged at this particular moment, Steve. Looked like he was signaling something uh, to the crew on the dock there, Brock. Yeah, well, he's got probably a pit crew out there. These boats do not carry radios. I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, poor Bill Baberton, all the way from Australia. He is dead in the water at the moment. But, boy, these two are very much alive, battling for second place. George Johnson has to go hard left, rudder to avoid hitting the Australian boat that's dead in the water. But George now is pulling out and taking over second place from Terry Turner, Brock. Yeah, you wonder whether maybe Terry's got himself some engine problems because he has fallen off the pace a bit as George Johnson grabs hold of a solid grip on second place, but I don't think he'll be able to overtake the leader at this particular point. Ron Armstrong seems to be in command, Steve. So much so, Brock, that he'd have to blow an engine. Something disastrous would have to happen right now for him to lose this race. Of course, with boats, uh, when the power goes away, they just come to an immediate halt. You don't have the coasting capability of a race car. <laughs> Nor do they have any paddles on board, so you just are out if they stop. As Ron Armstrong takes that giant checkered flag, got to have a flag big enough so you can see it all the way front at two-mile course, Steve. Boy, you certainly do. There's just a lot of things you have to do differently in boat racing than you would in any other kind of motorsports, especially 
especially the start uh, that we've seen that is so unique. And here, back in third spot, is Terry Turner, the U-5 boat with the twin Chevrolets up in front of him. He's still trying to catch George Johnson, uh, but it doesn't look good for him either. Boy, that's a rough ride. All that noise, all that smoke and fumes and exhaust pipes right out in front of that boat. What a courageous guy old Terry Turner is, but he's not going to be able to catch this man. George Johnson, the Washington driver, on his way to a solid finish here in this first heat of the championship division. So Ron Armstrong coasts into the dock, the crew ready with a line to tie him up, and he's got to be tickled to death winning this championship division, heat number one. They don't have to worry about unbuckling in these boats, Brock. You just stand up. And here, taking second place, is George Johnson in the U-8. So we'll be back with more from the Clear Lake Thunderboat Regatta after these messages. Good to have it. Yes, the green is out. We've got to start. And there, on the right side of your screen, once again, the four outboard boat of Jimbo McConnell has himself a lead, but Todd Yarley and that old conventional has given him a good hard run for it, Steve. This looks a little bit like a repeat of the first team, where uh, Yarley went very wide in the first turn, and Jimbo hugged the buoy as he's doing right now. Well, I think it's just a question of lightness and handling uh, versus the heavier, uh, more cumbersome boat at top just don't think he can wind that old boat into the corner as tight as Jimbo McConnell can. And of course, on a two-mile course, boy, the closer you can stay to the boys, you can cut hundreds of yards off the distance. Well, I think Todd Yarling may be running more like two and a half miles, the course that he has set for himself here. Look at Jimbo. He has got to be grinning from ear to ear, Brock. Boy, he sure is, but he's had it all his way so far, Steve. Let's not forget that he has not had anything but the lead in these two heats, so he's never been in, in any kind of traffic and never had to run through any wakes, so that test awaits him. I've got a feeling that Todd Yarling in the ancient old Tosti Osti boat we see right here is getting a little sick and tired to see in those four outboards in front of him. Well, the, those four outboards are exactly the same models that uh, Renato Molinari's got on his boat, except Renato, of course, only has two, but his boat is roughly about half the size and weight. There goes Todd Yarling out in the bull rushes again. He's trying to lean into the turns, but the boat just doesn't want to respond. He's, whoa! Just about up on the beach with the folks. And Mitch Evans, uh, that kind of opened the door for him. Mitch moving up there. He failed to even uh, finish the first heat, so he's having a much better second race. Yeah, but Todd is uh, smoking right there. But injustice to Todd Yarling. Let's not forget that those turns three and four are much tighter. So uh, he really has a big handicap with that big heavy boat down there in turns three and four versus the wider turns of one and two as we see him going through now. Boy, there is just a beautiful shot of Jimbo McConnell exiting the picture, or trying to exit the picture on the right-hand side. You know, the owner of that boat, a good friend of yours, Don Aronobrock, he calls it half-jokingly an unlimited catamaran. <laughs> I know. Well, Arano is just an unbelievable guy and a real character and a brilliant boat designer, along with Gary Garbrecht. And there is Mitch Evans. It looked as if he might have been slowing down the last time we saw him, and finally he just kind of floats to a halt out there, and he's out of the boat. But it doesn't look like it's sinking or anything, so he's not in any danger, so they'll just let him sit there. In all of our motorsports coverage, we seem to always be talking about changing track conditions. Well, nowhere can it change any faster than the surface of the water. And Brock earlier had a chance to talk to Jimbo McConnell about water conditions. Jimbo, what kind of, how about the water today? Uh, is this the kind of water that this boat likes, or are you going to have some problems? No, uh, I wish the wind was blowing and the water was a lot rougher myself because this is a... This is a 30-foot tunnel with four engines, the four Johnson 400 horsepower engines on it. And because it's a tunnel and it's 30 feet long, the rough water is to my advantage. And when we tested and set our 102 mile an hour average, we set that in a four-foot chop in about a 30 mile an hour wind. And the boat never got out of shape. So uh, I, for this particular boat, the rougher the water, the better off we are. Jimbo, uh, can you... Uh can you work in other boats' wakes better uh, because of this hull design uh, than, than you might be able with a conventional boat? Well, I don't know because I've never had this boat in a race. In a Formula One boat, and it's a tunnel boat with the uh, Johnson Revenue 400 horsepowers on them, uh, you can negotiate wakes very well with them. But in unlimited hydroplanes, you have that gigantic rooster tail. And I really don't know until I get out there and can tell you firsthand of what it's going to be like out there. I've, I've had nightmares of what it's going to be out like, like out there. So uh, we'll wait and see, and then uh, 
put it all together and see what we've got. And he is still yet to encounter that rooster tail. Did he say he's had a record in a four-foot chop? I won't even fish in a four-foot chop. Here is Todd Yarling in that second position, closing the gap maybe a little bit on Jimbo, or Jimbo's backed off to save those four motors, Brock. Yeah, you may be right, Steve, but, you know, when you look at that boat, what a classic old design. But here's the wave of the future. Interesting contrast. The USA 1, the four engines totally displace about 700 cubic inches. Todd Yarling's single engine displaces over 1,600 cubic inches. But a tremendous difference in weight and efficiency, really. The upwards are tremendous. And look at Todd Yarling. Jimbo may get his first rooster tail. If Yarling, uh, he went wide again, Brock. He just can't get down on the pole, so to speak, in the groove, if there is such a thing. He just, that big old horse just wants to swing real wide, and Jimbo just tucks in against those boys and keeps on trucking. But here comes Todd again. He's definitely not going to give up. We know the handling, Brock, of a 30-foot tunnel hole like this is so good that the establishment in unlimited racing, uh, this could be the last time you see him. It's hard to say. Of course, they have to face the realities that old boat behind him with that big Allison and getting, as we said, more and more scarce. So they may not have any choice. They may have to stick with him. Boy, on the straightaway, Jarling just charges on him hard on that nitrous button, and he actually picks up a number of boat lanes down that front straight. He sure does. The boat, the big uh, conventional behind there is, is handling very well in this broader corner up here, turns one and two, but it's down at the other end that he has all the problems. And I wonder how long, how much nitrous has he got left in that uh, can? You know, it isn't an unlimited supply. No, it certainly isn't. In fact, uh, a lot of the traditional boat drivers like Yarling have complained about the layout of this course. They really don't like that tight turn three and four. Well, I can see why, because it, it's uh, that's the place he's losing all of his time. In fact, if there were equally uh, radius corners all the way around here, he might be giving McConnell a lot more trouble than he is right now. We were talking about changing conditions, Brock. There's a little more of a chop on the water right now than we have seen today thus far. But look at the way that uh, tunnel hull just floats across those uh, little waves here in Clear Lake. Just no problems at all. And McConnell is just squeezing those cans as nice and tight as he can. And Todd Yarling is probably not going to be able to catch him unless he loses one or more motors. But Yarling just hangs in there all the way. I've got to admire the way this young man is driving that big old boat. This is the front straightaway. When they cross the finish line, Brock, they will be on the last lap. Todd Yarling currently second, and if Jimbo makes the slightest mistake or if one of those four motors can start to uh, misfire, it could be all it takes for the young 26-year-old rookie to pick up a heat victory. No question. There is a disadvantage in this four-engine setup because you simply have four times the complication that you would have in a, in a single-engine boat. So they've got to think about that, and that is a factor here. You'd have to have a platoon of guys just to change spark plugs. Yeah, imagine that. Eight to 32 spark plugs are going to change up between every race. I'm sure. But look how well the second place boat, Todd Yarling, handles at the apex there in turns one and two. He's doing a, just a sensational job. You know, Madison, Wisconsin is a big center of this kind of racing, and they've run a bunch of Gold Cups uh, out in that area. As Jimbo McConnell, not a Gold Cup driver, but a world champion, as you said earlier, in these single-engine Formula One boats that are so popular worldwide. The Unlimiteds are really more popular here in the United States, and as we said, down in Australia and New Zealand, but not so much in Europe. The Europeans, like those single-engine tunnel hulls, like Renato Molinari and Jimbo McConnell, have all their experience in, Steve. And six laps of racing in a heat is a piece of cake for a Jumbo McConnell or a Renato. They run, have run races as long as 24 hours. Absolutely. That's on the River Seine, right uh, in the center of Paris. They run a 24-hour boat race. Hard to believe that you can... Of course, they use a couple of drivers just like they do in the long endurance races. But these big boats, uh, especially the big Allison and Rolls engine boats, would pound you apart in a matter of a few minutes, much less a few hours. You just couldn't take the punishment. Well, here is Todd Yarling, not giving up, still standing on the gas and the nitrous oxide, trying to catch Jimbo McConnell. Both skating around on him, getting a little out of the water. But it's going to be Jimbo McConnell who will win this one as he is right now in the front straightaway and just about to cross the finish line. Jumbo with a wave. Boy, he's had a great day. Well, it's second in a row for him. Undefeated. He remains undefeated. Todd Yarling still is principal and really only rival that he's had as Todd Yarling gives everybody a wave. Crossing the line, doing a very good job. Uh, unfortunately, only a two-boat race, but we'll be back with more unlimited hydroplane racing from Clear Lake, Texas after these messages. So stick with us. The Thunderbolts will be back.
gets over that line too quickly, as we said. A one-lap penalty. It may be, though, that Bavernin's all right. Yes, a clean start. And Bavernin is coming on very strong. You can tell that, boat because, of course, the absence of that big high wing that Ron Armstrong has coming into the screen and overtaking Bavernin as they sail into turn two. And look at Armstrong trying to take Bavernin on the outside. He's going around the hard way, Steve. But what a proud moment this is for members of the Victoria Speedboat Club in Australia as Baberton, at least for the moment, leads this Thunderboat heat. Only the third time an Australian boat has ever been in American waters in this kind of competition. On the inside is Baberton. And Armstrong trying to overtake him on the outside. Interesting thing here, Steve, in boat racing, Armstrong can't just duck in behind him and cross his wake. He's got to stay on the outside and literally outrun him the long way around the course. If it was on pavement or dirt or something, he could just slow down and try to duck in behind him and take him on the inside. The Australian built a big surprise here, Brock. They did not fare well in the first heat. I think the competition took them a little lightly. Fun having them around, but uh, weren't competitive. Right. Look, down on the pole, that is the Australian boat, the wingless machine of Bill Baberton. It is just rocketing down this main straightaway. He sure is, and I think that Ron Armstrong has had some problems. It looked as if he kind of slid out of our screen there, as Baberton is now uncontested. Yes, indeed, Armstrong on the sidelines. The boat has just come to a complete halt. Look how far into the water it sinks after it loses its speed. So for 42-year-old Ron Armstrong of Lakewood, California, his day is done. But the Australian have really got their adrenaline pump. And here is the race for second. On the inside is Terry Turner from California with the twin Chevrolet boat. On the outside is George Johnson, the Executone boat. Well, it's a repeat of the first team. Remember, these two guys ran literally gunnel to gunnel all the way around, just beating on each other. Finally, Terry uh, made it at the finish, and uh, Johnson went on to uh, take second place. But it looks like Terry is not going to let it happen again. He's Really, uh, he's got the right line. He's on the inside. And boy, that old stock block boat is just showing all kinds of power. But remember, again, they twist that engine almost 8,000 RPMs as compared to maybe 3,3500 with the aircraft engine. Reliability, a big factor with that combination. Well, now Johnson has squeezed out maybe a boat length lead, but he may have to give that up because don't forget, they're diving down into that tight turn three and four, and it could be that Turner will just dip inside come out ahead. This is just a terrific race, Brock. It sure is. Boy, I'll tell you, these boats are so hairy and so wild. Fortunately, we haven't seen anything happen like this yet, but they are capable of getting too much air underneath them, Steve, and flipping right over on their backs. Well, some people feel they are the most dangerous creations in all the motorsports. Well, they're so overpowered, they're so unstable, and they're running in an intrinsically unstable water. There is Renato Molinari in the, behind you in the back of the screen. He's coming up on the inside using that superior handling, but I don't think he's got enough power to play with these two. And Renato doesn't want a bat. He, uh, just like Jimbo, he really has not experienced that rooster tail. doesn't want to. Well, no, he is tucked in him right in against those boys so he could by running a lot shorter distance come up and compete with uh, Johnson and Turner but I doubt it over the long haul boy it's a little red rocket down this straightaway <laughs> and rocketing right by him goes Terry Turner on the inside and on the far right outside skid through the water George Johnson wow he must have thought he drove into a car wash when uh, Turner went by him there it uh, it was uh, it looked pretty good until those two boats appeared so Molinari out here playing with the big boys in an 18-foot boat disguised to be about 22 feet long. And here is the leader, Bill Baberton from Australia, the BS-41. BS standing for Victoria Speedboat Club, who funded this effort and got he, the crew, and the boat over here. And there's George Johnson currently riding in second, but being contested by Terry Turner, who dives down in the inside. And that rooster tail, you see, that's Baberton just in front of him. Look at that. Turner now dives inside Baberton, and they're fighting for the lead, Steve. Oh, this is just terrific. The Australian on the outside without the wing, throwing a rooster tail high into the air and on the inside. The twin Chevrolet power plant from California of Terry Turner. I got to say, Steve, among all the boats we've seen here today, the most spectacular show has been put on by this man from California, Terry Turner, a real underdog, but showing all kinds of power and style all day long. And that's why back in 1975, this man, your new leader, Terry Turner, was voted into the Marine Racing Hall of Fame. Well, he sure deserved it. And based on his performance today, they may, may do a revo 
out and vote him in again. <laughs> He's just running away from him. Now, that's George Johnson behind him. Molinari way over on the right side of your screen. Still tucked down on the inside. He may not be out of this thing yet. You know that? Oh, I think you're right, Brock. But unfortunately, this man is. Bill Baberton from Australia, who really thrilled the crowd here today, waving that he's okay, but the boat is broken. Well, that's twice in a row. Two races today for Baberton and a tough break as Terry Turner continues to dominate, showing more power than probably anybody expected to come out of a pair of engines that started their lives in a pickup truck someplace. Terry Turner on the inside is leading, but at this point he can probably hear the throaty roar of the big aircraft power plant challenging him in the boat of George Johnson. Johnson on the outside. The better driver in these turns, Brock, is going to win it. Sure is, and it looks like, kind of reminds you of uh, Terry Turner in one of those old upright dirt track cars uh, in the old days, and he really literally power slides that thing through the corners. Look at that. Puts on a little opposite lock. Could be running on a mild dirt track. And you can see why. The seat in the boat I tried out was so very, very tight. You could easily get pitched out of one of these boats. Oh, Terry, boy, he is one tough guy. He's getting a face full of fumes and noise and water and what else and just getting pounded around, but he won't give up, and he's in this race, and he's going to take Johnson. You know, if the slightest thing goes wrong with one of those Chevrolet engines, even if it blows a valve cover gasket, Terry is going to get a face full of oil to add to all the rest of it. A lot like running the old uh, front engine. Oh, trouble for Terry Turner. Arm up, boat slowing down. George Johnson skates past into the lead, and it looks as if Turner's finished. So Terry Turner, who had uh, all of the automotive types certainly on his side, has got some big problems, and this man is now the leader. George Johnson is somewhere struggling out and running around in circles is Renato. You know, Brock, there's a hole, I think, in that boat. It looks like it may be taking on some water. Sure does. He's up standing on the hull. He's waving. Yeah, he wants help. But he Brock, they can't come out and help him with the race running. There's a rule. If he was to jump into the water, he could stop this race. And if he doesn't think of that pretty soon, the boat is going to sink on him. Well, that's what he's going to do. I'll bet he is. Yes, he's in the water. And that's good news for George Johnson because at this point, the race is declared official, and he, this boat, the Executone Special, will be the winner. According to the American Power Boat Association rules, if any driver, either voluntarily or involuntary, gets into the water, the race is over. There you see Terry Turner in the water. There you see the red flag signaling the end of the race. Driving Miss Renault, a brand new boat on the circuit, Milner Urban finished second and third in heats, has never won before. Jim Cropfield in the bud, hoping to erase the disappointment of one year ago. They won the opening heat, but they didn't compete in the second. So far, the best bet seems to be the Atlas. They have a first and a second, and Hanauer is certainly capable of winning. In the Squire shop, it's Tommy D. He's been consistent with a fourth and a third, and remember, he's the 76th Gold Cup champion. Next comes Jack Schaefer in the American Speedy printing. Schaefer won the concert. And rounding out the six boat final field, Ron Armstrong in Chet's music. Remember, he won both heats in the slower division, but now for the first time, the boat goes in the water against the top qualifiers, the Bud and the Atlas. Well, it's been a tremendous fight just to get into this final round. And for Jim Cropfeld, he still has his problems. A couple of big concerns in the Budweiser camp, Paul. They won the first heat comfortably. No problem there. Motor problems in the second heat. They've now changed engines for the final. But it's a question mark. And then let's not forget what happened last year. The fact they ran out of fuel coming down to an apparent victory. Compounded now by the fact that the race is one lap longer this year than a year ago. So two big question marks for Jim Cropfeld and the Bud crew. And for Chip Hanauer, trouble as well. The boat is still not handling. No, and that boat is quite a bit lighter than Budweiser, so it wants to get up and fly quite a bit more. And they've been putting spoilers on the bottom of the boat, Paul, trying to get it nailed down on the water so it will start handling better for him. And if those two continue to have difficulty, there is a boat I've been watching. Mill Irvin is right there. He has been consistent throughout the run. No mechanical problems at all. If they would falter at the front, he's certainly knocking on the door. The course is set. The clock in its final seconds now as the six boats come to the line. A 15-mile-an-hour crosswind blows across the straightaway. The water six to ten feet deep. Some of the drivers have complained about debris on the water. Ron Armstrong pulls way wide as they come down to the line. You can see here Chip Anauer down on the inside where he likes to start. And, of course, right next to him, Kropfeld, who wants to get down in there and keep tabs on one another as they head for that first turn. It's a good start. All of the boats are up on line. It's going to be crowded down there in the first turn. Five boats hit the line together. 
Hanauer and Krapfeld down on the inside where they want to be. Now Armstrong cuts across the front of Tommy Deep. Deep's boat is in the air, darts off the course. We've got problems here on the start. They keep the race running. Krapfeld is out in front. Hanauer is right behind him. But Tommy Deep now floating to a stop as Krapfeld streams down the back straightaway. Yes, Paul, Tommy Deep ran right behind the rooster tail of Armstrong. And of course, that is a tremendous amount of water flying back there. No doubt it knocked the front of his. There we see the boat in the water dead. Tommy Deeth obviously not in too bad a shape. He's standing up, waving his arms that he's okay, but come get me. He wants to go back to the dock. So Tommy Deeth got washed down by the tons of water that are thrown off the back of these Thunderboats. Here's Jim Cropfeld out in front, being chased by Chip Hanauer. But a serious problem. Tommy Deeth fortunately not injured when he got washed down as Ron Armstrong came across the front. Here's a look at that first turn again. Now, Ron Armstrong is on the far outside. Right next to him is Tommy Deeth. And Armstrong cuts across the front of Deeth's boat. Deeth gets washed down. That's the Budweiser down on the inside. But look at the tons of water that's pouring in on top of Tommy Deeth now. That had to do some damage. Oh, it looked as though he got airborne way up in the air and very nearly went over. Here's another view of it. We'll look at it from the outside. There we see Armstrong cutting right across in front of Tommy Deeth. And of course, he took all of that water right in the face, up in the air, very high. It's a miracle that he didn't go over. Tommy Deeth, a very fortunate young man. He was able to climb out of the cockpit, and they will tow the boat off the course as long as he stays with the boat. They decide that everything is safe. The race can continue on. Here is the second place boat, Chip Hanauer. He is chasing Krapfeld, but there may be damage to this boat as well. We'll keep an eye on it. Ron Armstrong, meanwhile, apparently oblivious to the problems that were created by his rooster tail for Tommy Deeth, maintains the number three position right now in Chet's Music. Krapfeld first, Hanauer second, Armstrong third. Over at the dock, they're now bringing Deeth's boat by. Let's go to Johnny Rutherford. I'm going to try to move in and get a word. There you can see the boat. It's really damaged. The steering wheel is smashed down. Tommy Deeth, just, I can't, can't get a word with him. He's headed for the ambulance, I think. He had blood on the front of his helmet, Paul. Very serious damage to the squire. Tommy Deeth washed down when Armstrong cut across the front. There is evidence of the tons of water that ride in the rooster tails of these hydroplanes. Here is our leader, Jim Cropfeld. He is well out in front. He is being pursued by last year's world champion, this man, Chip Hanauer in the Atlas. Ron Armstrong continues to ride in third place. And Cropfeld is setting a sizzling pace, 127 mile per hour average on the opening lap. He's fallen off only slightly since that time. So Hanauer is really going to have to come up with something if he hopes to contend for this world championship event title. There you see the separation. First to second place, here comes Chip Hanauer. But he has a lot of time to make up. But Hanauer seems to lose power just a little bit. And perhaps part of the reason, now you can see it. Look at that right sponson. Johnny Rutherford, there's a hole there. Yes, it, it, obviously he's knocked the bottom out of the sponson and it poked a hole in the top. And he is now rolling to a stop. Chip Hanauer apparently has assessed the damage to the right side of his boat and decided it cannot continue. Kropfeld is unchallenged for the lead. And Hanauer, whatever the problem is, he's trying to, he is out of the cockpit. We could see him crashing there, trying to unfasten the harness. He's gone to the back of the boat, Paul. He's in the water. Hanauer is in the water. Now, the rules say the minute the pilot is in the water, the race is stopped. He is hanging on at the back end. Now, will the officials stop this race? And how badly is Hanauer's boat damaged? Does it really need to stop the race? Oh, there you see it. There's a big hole in the right side. Yes, evidently the bottom of the sponsor was knocked out, and the water pressure forced the hole in the top. So the race has been stopped. Jim Kropfeld climbs out of his machine. They will have to rerun the entire event again. There is Bernie Little. He is with Jim Kropfeld. Gary Gerald is close by. We'll see if Gary can't move in now and get a word with Jim Kropfeld. See it on for right now, okay? Okay. Jim, it's a whole new ball game now. What does this do to the nerves? Well, it doesn't bother the nerves, but it sure is going to hurt the crew. <laughs> we, we can hope the engine holds together for six more laps. Same thing <laughs> happened in Seattle uh, about a month ago. Uh, after we had one lap to go, had it won, somebody dove in the water, stopped the race. We had to go win it again. All right. So, uh, Atlas, oh, my God. We get... Oh, my God. What do you think? Are you going to be able to get back in the water? I don't know. The... They could probably put some screws in the bottom when I came around there. I must have hit something coming in. My steering worked, and so I came around here and tried to straighten out, and uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't straighten out. Something's got bound up in there and tore the plates off there or something. I don't know what happened. 
So Dave Cully and the Bud crew have work to do. Chip Henauer, because he jumped in the water, will not be able to start when they rerun the World Championship. The Bud and Kropfeld's boat now being lowered into the water as we are ready for a restart here. They did not have time, though, to work on the motor. Normally, they would have done that. That motor has been run very hard, but they had to pay all of their attention to the back of the boat getting it repaired. Here is Chip Henauer's boat. You can see a giant hole in the right sponson where it has been badly bad. Now, Tommy Deep will not be able to go to the final round either. You saw the damage on his boat. And Ron Armstrong has been disqualified for cutting across the front of Deep's boat. So Renato Molinari, as a result of the points scored earlier, will move into the final heat, as will Jim Bo McConnell in Miss USA, another outboard-powered machine. And George Johnson in Executone will move into the final heat as well. They all are getting a chance now as a result of the problems that developed in the first run. The real question is why did Chip Hanauer jump into the water if the boat was not in danger of sinking? And there is some heated discussion going on on the dock about that situation. It might have been a ploy to put him ahead in the national championship. We're ready to run again as they come to the line. It's a ragged start. Molinari is down on the inside. McConnell on the outside. They're well ahead of the rest of the field. As we start this race with Molinari appearing to jump the start, we'll have to wait and see what the officials say. Now the Budweiser, under full power, begins to charge up the middle, followed by Jack Schaefer and the American Speedy. Boy, look at the head of steam that Cropfield has going into that first turn, heading for the buoy. He has really got it turned on. And Molinari has got to be very careful on that small boat that he doesn't get tangled in the giant rooster tail that Cropfield is putting up as he powers now off the turn onto the back straightaway where he hits speeds upwards of 175 miles per hour. Jim Cropfield, that giant Griffon engine roars. Now remember, it's been rung pretty hard in the first segment of this world championship. They didn't have a lot of time to look at it. Will it continue to last here? It is certainly performing well now. Kropfeld out in front and running strong. Of course, Paul, they have that patch that they put on the rear of the boat. There we see Jack Schaefer running in second place. But the patch around the prop shaft and the uh, back of the boat on Budweiser, we've got to see if that will hold up. So there are some question marks about Kropfeld's mount as he turns toward the main stretch one more time, being chased by Jack Schaefer in the American Speedy. And in this choppy body of water here at Clear Lake, you can see the stress taking its toll on these boats and drivers. The boat's pounding. in trouble. Cropfield slows. Cropfield slowing down. The engine appears to have faltered. There's no rooster tail. We see a big backfire. Here comes Schaefer on the run as Schaefer screams past Cropfield and into first place. And Cropfield's grip on has failed. Yes, Paul, it appeared that it backfired, so it must have gone out of time. There's something seriously wrong inside Bud's engine. Miss Renault charges past in second place. Here comes Renato Molinari. He's currently in third. And a disgusted Bernie Little as his engine on the bud has failed. Now, at this moment, because of this failure, Chip Hanauer wins the season-long national championship. So jumping into the water and stopping the earlier run did benefit Chip Hanauer. Now a problem on the speedy. Jack Schaefer goes to a stop. And Miss Renault charges into the lead. Tremendous turn of events. First it was Tommy Deep, then it was Chip Hanauer out of the race. Crop failed fell by the sidelines, and now Jack Schaefer is out, and here we look down from the helicopter at the bud. Crop fell, hurling a life jacket back into the cockpit in disgust. Remember, a year ago, he lost the world championship when he ran out of fuel. His hopes spoiled again today. But look at this amazing turn of events. Milner Irvin out in front of this race. Most people thought he would not have had a chance at all. It's a brand new boat. New this season, he turns back to see who is chasing him in second place. And here is the fight for second, as Renato Molinari is chasing Executone. Molinari, look at the boat jump in the air as Molinari comes past Executone as Executone slows in the water. Boy, the stopping of that race has certainly taken its toll. There are three boats that were in the running completely out of it now. Executone just now going dead in the water, Paul. And Jimbo McConnell, as he comes off the fourth turn, is now being scored in second place. The officials have penalized Molinari. One lap for jumping the start. He'll have to run an extra lap. George Johnson, the executone, he can't get it fired. They're done for the day. Remember, history being made today. This is the first time the outboards have ever competed with the Unlimiteds. And after this strange turn of events, we now find the outboards running second and third behind this man, Milner Irvin in the Renault. 
right now. Irvin, the Renault, the turbocharged Allison aircraft power plant, a new design on the hull, a wood hull. But one man very happy about it, he's with Gary Gerald. Gary? Can you believe it? No. I stood here last year and saw the Budweiser run out of gas with a lot less than a lap. So I don't know, but Renault being world champion, oh my God! <laughs> Gary Shainis still doesn't believe it's possible as Mill Irvin charges around this course. If he can only hold it together now, the final turn, the final straightaway, this will be his first Thunderboat Championship if he can do it. It seems that he can coast now. A last stream of the engine, and Mill Irvin has won the World Championship here on Clear Lake at Houston, the new world champion. What a great thrill must be for Milner Irvin to come across. And of course, the whole team who has worked hard all year getting that boat ready. And John, we're right down here among the crew. Jim Kurt, the veteran crew chief of 20 years. John Stodiker, who designed this radical, innovative boat. Jerry Shaneth, the owner, waiting for Milner Irvin to get in here at the dock so they can all offer their congratulations. The new national champion driver, Chip Hanauer, congratulates the new world champion owner, Jerry Shaneth. As Mill Irvin coast to a stop, here is Jimbo McConnell. Who would have believed it? But the circumstances of this day has put Miss USA, her four outboard engines, into second place. Here comes Mill heading for the dock. Look at Jerry Shaneth. Boy, there are two happy men, the new world champions. Renato Molinari is now running his penalty lap, an extra lap. Nevertheless, he comes home in third place. Now, let's go to Gary Gerald with a new world champion. What does it feel like at this point? Are there words there to describe the feeling of a world championship? Very happy. I, I'm, I feel a little guilty about taking it that way, but uh, I guess part of, the, uh, part of the game plan is to last and not break down, and that's what we did. It's uh, still awfully rough out there, though. 